Thank you, Pastor Tim. If you would, grab your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 4. So this will be the first of several sermons today. Um, and after this, we'll have a, a short break. I've entitled this sermon, The Shedding of Innocent Blood. My topic today is also known as the doctrine of blood guiltiness. And I want to tell you from the get-go, I am heavily indebted to abolitionist leader Rusty Thomas for what I am about to share. Some of you have heard him preach what I'm getting ready to preach. Let us pray. Oh, Father, would you send your spirit to lead us in the preaching and the hearing of your word. Oh Lord, I pray that we may have boldness to speak to the mountain and command it to be thrown into the sea and be gone forever. Equip us, oh Lord, according to your word, we pray. Amen. All right, so the shedding of innocent blood What does the Bible say about this matter? The first two most basic scriptures that come to mind that address the issue are the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. Amen? The second, you know, let's go to the New Testament because some people don't want to take the Old Testament seriously. The New Testament, our Lord Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. That should be enough to bring an end to baby murder in our land. We see the first murder in the Bible in Genesis chapter 4. If you've been in church long, you are certainly familiar with the story. Cain and Abel, the two sons of Adam and Eve. We find ourselves in Genesis chapter 4 verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Wow. Wow. One brother killed another. And the Lord was walking with them and speaking with them in a very special and unique way. And God just asked him a question. Where's your brother? It's kind of like... God approaching Adam and Eve in the garden. Hey, where are you at? He's God. He knows, but he seeks us out and he engages us in conversation. Does he not? Cain replied, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? We know the answer to that question, don't we? Yes, we do. And then the Lord says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. You all... God does more than just see the blood. We have difficult images in this room with us today for a reason. Seeing them, seeing these photos of this blood, seeing photos of victims communicate something to us that we desperately need to hit home hard deep down inside, right? Right? It's happening. North Carolina's on track to have over 30,000 abortions this year. It's happening. We need to not hide from it. So God sees it all. And for us, we see blood occasionally. And, And sometimes that's appropriate. Many times it's not. But our Lord, our God does more than just see the blood. He 
hears the blood. Abel did not deserve to die. We're talking about the shedding of innocent blood. Not innocence in the sense that he had never sinned, but innocent in the sense that he had done nothing deserving of death. God hears the blood, hears the voice of innocent blood. When someone murders another, they often think, I won't have to hear them anymore. But this passage says that killing someone does not silence them. For those who have had abortions, don't you hear? And isn't there a source of of shame and guilt that can haunt, that we can only be freed from by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ? And praise God, he does that, as we said earlier, right? You all, innocent blood, close to 70 million victims, at least in the last 49 years, is crying to us from the ground. Killing someone does not silence them. God hears, do we hear? Flip a couple pages to Genesis 6. Here, God speaks to Noah after the flood. And so things were so wicked before the flood that after the flood, God sets up a few things a little bit differently. At least we see that, you know, I said Genesis 9, I'm 6, I meant Genesis 9. Verse 5, 6, and 7. Forgive me, sorry about that. So Genesis 9, verse 5. This is after the flood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Here, God says that if someone sheds the blood of an innocent man, I will require a reckoning from the life of the one who shed the blood. We get to verse 6. He says the same thing. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Many believe that's a reference to civil rulers who are to bear the sword against the evildoer and to serve as God's avenger against the one who commits crime. We see all that spelled out clearly in Romans chapter 13. But this is God's plan. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. This is huge support for the death penalty. People are like, wait, you don't support abortion, but you support the death penalty? Yes, we do. Two entirely different things, amen? And then we get to verse 7. I don't have to throw this in there, but I just want to. And you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. You all, we see that. We see God say that in Genesis 1.28. It was the first command God ever gave to Adam and Eve. Did you know that? He said that before he said make disciples. He said that before he said do not murder. He said that before he told Adam and Eve anything else. He said be fruitful and multiply. And then after the flood, he says it again so quickly. He says it again so quickly. Y'all, we're turning over tables in our culture. A faithful abolitionist is going to turn over the tables in our culture that desperately need to be turned over. So that's right after the flood. Turn to Numbers 35, verse 33. You shall not pollute the land in which you live, For blood pollutes the land, and no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. Oh my, these are difficult words from from God to all people. We see a reference to the polluting of the land. You know, that's a 
connects back to Genesis 4 about the blood, the voice of of Abel, of innocent Abel, his blood crying out to God. So you shall not pollute the land in which you live for blood pollutes the land. Do we not live in a land overrun by pollution? Do you ever ride by a dump or just some nasty part of town or maybe somebody you know or a neighbor who doesn't keep up their yard well and there's just trash everywhere? Okay. And you just kind of want to be like, how does anyone live like that? And that's the United States of America, you all. We have been overrun and overcome by pollution. And repentance is needed at a national level. So verse 33 goes on to say, No atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed in it. What is atonement? It has to do with the covering of sin. It has to do with an offering that takes away sin. And you know, time only permits me to, to say but so much about that. But no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of the one who sheds it. The one who willfully murders someone else should pay with their own life, according to the word of God. I didn't design this to be a talk on capital punishment, but I, I, I and we're going to speak later to, you know, what about the mom? Is she a victim or, or you know, is she a murderer? Dave Buboltz is going to speak on that clearly. But right here, we see that when innocent blood is shed, God is going to bring judgment to the people who have shed that blood. President Abraham Lincoln understood this. He made a reference to the doctrine of blood guiltiness in his second inaugural address. And in his opinion, he attributes the entire civil war to the judgment of God upon our nation for the sin of slavery. He said this in his inaugural, his second inaugural address. He said, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass. Yet if God will that it continue until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. Wow. In his godly, biblically informed opinion, the 630,000 people that died in the Civil War was God's judgment on our nation for the blood shed as people beat their dark-skinned slaves that they were oppressing. This is the doctrine of blood guiltiness. Our nation violated the liberty of our black brothers and sisters. And through the abolitionist movement at that time, God warned our nation to let them go free. And our nation refused. And the 630,000 people that died in the Civil War was the price our nation paid for our disobedience to God in the systematic oppression of image bearers of God. In the Bible, we see people wanting to avoid having innocent blood on their hands. In Psalm 51, David, who had murdered a man, he he did have innocent blood on his hands, but he did what any murderer should do. He cried out to God. He said, deliver me from blood guiltiness. Oh God, oh God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. He's saying, God, I've sinned. God, my hands are bloody. But if you deliver me, if you deliver me, I'm going to worship you. That's King David. We see Jonah. He's on the boat. And everyone realizes that the storm is his fault. And they throw Jonah over the sea, but the sailors cry out, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. 
So the people on the boat with Jonah, they didn't want innocent blood on their hands and they cried out to God. In Matthew 27, Pontius Pilate, as Jesus Christ, who was about to be crucified, stood before him. He said publicly to the crowd, I am innocent of this man's blood. You want to crucify him? I've tried to talk you out of it. He could have tried a lot harder. Could he not? And he wanted to himself, he was trying to be his own savior, which does not work. Amen. He tried to wash the innocent blood off of his hands himself, but he had this concern to not have innocent blood on his hands. Then in Acts chapter five, as the apostles begin preaching the gospel, the, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, the Senate, there's a few different names for that group of governing authorities at that time. They spoke to the apostles because the apostles kept saying, you crucified the Lord of glory that you were waiting. And the apostles said, no, they said to the apostles, you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. See, in Acts chapter 2, Peter preached and they were convicted because they realized the hand that they played in the crucifixion of Christ. And they said, brothers, what shall we do? They said, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they did so and they were saved and 3,000 were baptized and repented that day. Beautiful thing. Amen. But here, they were trying to avoid having sin on themselves. You all, are we concerned about the blood on the hands of the United States of America. I believe we are, and that's why we're here. And you all, we're going to do something about this because our nation isn't going to stand much longer if we continue on this path. Turn to Psalm 106, please. The nation of Israel was a wicked nation that had forsaken God. They were sacrificing their children. You all, we are a wicked nation. We started out knowing what it was that God required of us, and we walked away. Have we not? We are not Israel in the sense of national political Israel by any means at all. But we have a lot in common with them, do we not? Psalm 106, verse 36. The psalmist writes of their evil. He says, they served their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood. There we go, the shedding of innocent blood the blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan and the land was polluted with blood. We've seen those ideas, right? Already, we've seen pollution, we've seen innocent blood. Uh, um, idolatry is no doubt a theme throughout the scripture. So, so we have a, a, do, a true biblical doctrine of blood guiltiness, right? This is a true consistent teaching throughout scripture. And the psalmist understood the passages that we've already covered. I believe that with all my heart. So verse 36, they serve their idols. You all, idolatry leads us to a bad place, does it not? They called for their idols, for their false gods. Some of their gods demanded the sacrifice of children. You all, they called it worship. Idolatry is no doubt false worship, amen? They called the giving of their children worship. One of the most notable occasions of this is found in 2 Kings 21. King Manasseh sacrificed his son as an act of worship. Today we have another nice name for child sacrifice. You all, we call it health care. It breaks my heart and it breaks yours. They called it worship. We call it health care. And for many in our nation, this justifies it. We're trying to keep someone healthy, they say. I want to tell you, the majority of pregnant women are not sick. Amen? And pregnancy is a normal part of healthy adulthood. Abortion is not health care. Verse 37, it says they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They needed to keep the other gods happy. You all... How many of you know that, that the Lord Jesus Christ, in his salvation, he gives and he gives and he gives and he gives and he gives. Demons, false gods, they take and they take and they take and they don't ever stop. 
and no amount of anything is ever enough. Amen? It's not enough. The Hebrew word for demon in this verse has to do with ancient Mesopotamian religions. It was referencing directly a spirit that you had to keep happy to grant you good health. And if you didn't keep this spirit happy, it would cripple you quickly. And idolatry is the same today. Idols still demand much of their worshipers, but our idols look different. They wear a different color dress. What are the idols that motivate child sacrifice today? I've got four that I want to share. There are no doubt more. Idol number one, sex. Many say I should be able to have sex without having to become responsible for the child. And no doubt this idea was promoted heavily during the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s. And no doubt it has become easier to live this way without getting pregnant because of birth control. Idol number two, image and reputation. People sacrifice their children so that they can sleep around, and obviously closely connected with idol number one of sex, but people sacrifice their children so they can sleep around, and no one will ever know because they can just get an abortion whenever they need one. Idol number three, career. How many of y'all know it's easier for a woman to go to work and make money if she doesn't have to be worried about raising kids? We even have companies such as Warner Brothers, Disney, Amazon, Starbucks, Meta, which is Facebook and Instagram, Bank of America, Intuit, which is QuickBooks, Dick's Sporting Goods, Uber and Lyft, Google, Nike, Procter & Gamble, Ford Motor Company, Target, Walmart, and dozens more who now will pay several thousand dollars for one of their female employees to go get an abortion. See, if the woman who gets pregnant, she's not going to be able to work as hard and serve the purpose of the company, right? So there's this idea of career, productivity, and also profit that fuels and motivates this tragedy. Idol number four has to do with financial stress. Kids are expensive. Can I get an amen? I've got seven. <laughs> Kids are expensive. Children, when not trusting God, can be a source of financial stress. This will never be a justification for murder. But we serve the almighty dollar. We don't like to be stressed out. We like life to be easy. And instead of trusting God to provide for your giant family of three children or your giant family of 14 children, okay, because the world looks at three and 14 both as giant, right? You know, so, so, so instead of, you know, just... just Here's what I'm trying to say is like, it don't matter how many kids you have. If you're trusting God, he's going to take care of you, right? You all, our nation justifies our idolatry. We hear the cry, my body, my choice. We know why that doesn't work. You have a body and so does your kid. The body inside of yours is not yours. It's just hanging out in there for 38 or 40 weeks or so. Amen. God says you shall not murder. That child that your body is creating, nourishing and sustaining is made in the image of God. And you shall not murder that human, that preborn neighbor, that brother, that sister. Some people justify this idolatry by examining and considering the quality of life and mother of the child after the child is born. I think that's ridiculous. We would never use this line of thinking at any other stage of life. We would never be okay with someone killing their kid because they lost their job and can't provide a good quality of life. Hard times happen, y'all. You make mistakes at work and get fired. Amen? Okay. Sometimes you get fired or, or you just get let go because there's no more work. Employment comes, employment goes. It's never a justification for murder. And so for a pregnant woman to say, there's no way I can support this kid, I ask, who made you God? How can you claim to know the future? That does not have to be your story. So when someone cries, what about the quality of life of the mother and the child? It is no excuse to shed innocent blood. It is no justification for the idolatry. 
we shall repent of carnality and materialism. According to one Christian economist, he says that if you make more than $11,000 a year, you're richer than 90% on the 90% of the people on the planet. So we're pretty rich folks in this room, aren't we? The same man said if you make over 33 grand a year, you're in the top 1% of the richest people on the planet. We are wealthy people, are we not? Not being able to provide for the child. Anyone who says that is assuming the place and the role of God and, and, and repentance is needed. People justify this idolatry by saying it's not a person yet. People try to dehumanize the, the baby. Well, the baby's just a clump of cells. We can get rid of it. Oh, so are you. <laughs> All right, right? It's a fetus. In Latin, which is where many of our English words come from, the word fetus means little one. That fetus growing inside you, woman of God, or woman, <laughs> doesn't matter if you're a woman of God or not, that fetus is a little one made in the image of God. So what, what does our idolatry as a nation mean for the future of our nation? Let's look at verse 40. You all judgment is coming to our land. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he abhorred his heritage. So the Israelites were sacrificing their children in demonic, idolatrous worship. Y'all know God's angry, right? I'm really glad he's an angry God. If he was not an angry God, then all the evil in our world would continue. I am so happy he is angry at his enemies. And I am so happy that he offers salvation to his enemies as well. We don't have to be stuck under his anger and his wrath. But verse 40 says he abhorred his heritage. That means he hated his inheritance. He hated his inheritance. Verse 41, he gave them into the hand of the nations so that those who hated them rule over. We see that with the Assyrian invasion that happened around 722 BC. We see this in, in, in the Old Testament. And the Assyrians from the north, they came down and they conquered the northern kingdom. And then King Nebuchadnezzar came in from the uh, east. And in three different invasions, he conquered the southern kingdom of Judah. And those who hated them ruled over them. Verses 42 and 43, their enemies oppressed them and they were brought into subjection under their power. If you're paying attention to the headlines you will see that our enemies, the other nations in our, this world that hate the United States, are beginning to oppress us. They're buying up our farmland and doing a number of things that may not seem very harmless right now. But I see the beginning initial workings of our judgment in this passage. Verse 43, many times he delivered them, but they were rebellious in their purposes and were brought low through their iniquity. You all, with idolatry, with sin, God brings us low. Aren't you glad that Jesus came? Doesn't he lift us up and sets us in a place where we may rule and reign with him? Let's go to verse 44. Next slide. You all, it doesn't have to end in judgment. You all, repentance is needed. We have blood on our hands as a nation. Repentance is needed at a national level. Verse 44, nevertheless, God looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. God creates distress and brings it on. But when his people cry out to him, he hears them. For their sake, he remembered his covenant and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. God had made many promises to the nation of Israel. Go back to Genesis 12 and God's uh, uh, promise to Abraham and countless other passages that we could spend hours in today. I want you to consider a promise that, that God has made. And we actually see it in Genesis 12 to Abraham. He says, through your descendants, I will bless all the families of the earth. And we know that that blessing 
is God sending his son, Jesus Christ. As abolitionists, we must be gospel-centered people. And I don't mean that in a gospel coalition sense. I, I, I mean that in the sense that if we are only a ministry of condemnation and we don't bring the good news and the hope of a crucified and risen Lord, we will have no, nothing to offer this world. There is hope in our message. There is hope for baby murderers. There is hope for all sinners, regardless of the type of sin that we are guilty of. Verse 45, God remembered his covenant. You all, he relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. He pours out his love on all who will call on him. Verse 46, he caused them to be pitied by all those who held them captive. Verse 47 is beautiful, you all. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations. This psalm is a, if you go all the way back to verse 1, it's a historical recounting of, of their national sin of their evil. And it ends here with hope. It ends here saying that a nation can turn, that it doesn't have to go all the way to judgment. Now for the Israelite people, it did go all the way to judgment because they did not repent. But here, if we as a nation, as a people, and I'm not talking about every single individual but I'm just talking about generally speaking, save us, if we cry out, save us, O Lord, our God. He is mighty to save. And he is faithful to his word and his promise. Verse 47 ends. Save us, O Lord, our God. Gather us from among the nations for what purpose? That we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. God is making a people for himself. 1 Peter 2.9 says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. For what purpose? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God saves his people so that we can glorify him and honor him and cry forth his praise, showing the world that he is worthy of all worship and all adoration. May we give thanks to God's holy name and glory in his praise. That can be the future of the United States. I believe in the sovereignty and the providence of God. And because I believe in that, I know that our actions as individuals and churches will have a direct impact on the future of our nation and how our nation goes down in history. If we act, if we move and do what we're supposed to do as individuals and churches, God will bring back his, or will relent in his judgment of our nation. You all, I want that. Back to Genesis 4-9, Cain asked God, am I my brother's keeper? You know, justification, right? You all, our responsibility in this life involves other people. If we are to be obedient to God, we must allow what we confess to affect how we relate to others. It's not just me and Jesus. It's not just you and Jesus. It's you and everyone else on this planet and particularly all the people that God brings into your life. You are, we are not a collection of isolated individuals. We have a responsibility toward one another. I pray that the church would repent. I pray you all that we would not rest until we stop the shedding of innocent blood in our nation. And I pray that in our repentance, we may cry to God for mercy and that we may live our life for the praise, honor, and glory of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. Would you move us to action? I pray that we would see the depths of our sin and our depravity. And I pray that we may see the depths and the beauty and the glories of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that we may live to your praise. I ask this, O oh God, in Jesus' name, amen.